There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all back to the innerverse. I'm Chance and I am gratuitously grateful that you are tuned in with us today. We're going to be peeling back the layers of seriousness and cranking up the dial on silliness with the return of today's guest, the whimsical wizard and hilarity healer known as Michael Murphy. You may remember Michael's first time with us earlier this summer when he explained the dynamics of a powerfully fun and heart opening modality he teaches called laughter yoga. As an instructor, he's been traveling the United States, transmuting fear and hate into great big belly laughs everywhere he goes. And today he's just so happening to drop by the Interverse Studio in person, which is uncommonly special. Today, Michael is specifically here to share a story from his journey earlier in the year that really helped open him up to the spirit and consciousness of nature in a big way. And later on, I'll be joining his circle for a laughter yoga class in person at a local venue dedicated to movement medicine. I am super stoked to be hosting another chat with Michael and even more excited to finally try out laughter yoga myself. And since I'm just overflowing with holiday cheer too, I decided to make this episode's second hour available to the free audience as my way of saying thank you and happy winter solstice. I really appreciate all of you out there listening for helping make this year the best one yet for Interverse by far. But if you feel bad that you didn't get me a present in return, don't worry, you don't have to. But if you did want to sign up for Interverse Plus on Patreon and get access to the huge archive of double-length episode extensions, I'd say, sounds like a nice way to give yourself a present that keeps on giving. Support this show at patreon.com forward slash Interverse and know that you Plus members out there are very extra appreciated. Now it's time to dive in with the captain of Kraken Up, who's making everyone's life a lot more magical, my most excellent friend and yours, Michael Murphy. Welcome back to the Interverse, dude. Thank you for having me. It's great to uh, be starting up another recorded conversation with you. We've been hanging out and talking a lot already, so it's like one of those moments of, I wish I could have captured everything that has been going on between us since you got here. We're lucky enough to have Michael here in the actual studio so I can see his shining beacon of love expression on his face. He's an, it's just amazing. And Michael's here to do a laughter yoga session here in my town. And I think we're going to start off talking a little bit about laughter yoga again, because if you didn't catch the previous episode with Michael, we had a great conversation about that healing modality, how amazing it is. And I guess you've had some level upping about that uh in your process and you've been getting more and more expansion in the laughter dimension so well, t- tell us about that yeah so in the past year since i was on interverse last i've definitely come into a much deeper awareness of the practice and more of not only what is it doing in the body but also the effects that it's having at a much wider social scale Laughter yoga, for those of you who are not familiar, is what I like to call hilariously simple. And it is the practice of non-judgmental laughter to bring about healing in the body. Spirit, soul, healing, all of it. And it's, uh, it's so simple because all one needs to do is, one, not judge others, and two, make eye contact. And the action of the practice is to laugh. So if you're not judging people, you're making eye contact, and you're laughing, the body goes through this process of opening and transmuting energies in a way that is remarkably healing for a lot of people. You're moving energy from lower chakra systems or from like more dense areas, which are fear, um, judgment, um, anger, and that's all being transmuted into a heart-based, a more open, connected, higher vibrational energy, uh, joy, silliness, love. And just by laughing, just by being with people, just by connecting and allowing yourself to connect. It's 
like the training wheels to spirituality in a way, because it's something that one, everybody is familiar with doing two, everybody can do. And three, it provides a great deal of benefit in how, in allowing one to see how their body works and reacts to a practice that doesn't require a ton of working beforehand. Anybody can do laughter yoga. Anybody can see the benefits from laughter yoga and anybody can take those benefits and apply them to other modalities and create a more developed practice. Hilariously simple. <laughs> totally. And I mean, you're describing something that I think we can all relate to feeling when you're having a deep belly laugh. It's going from like your stomach area or abdomen area. Muscles are spasming down there and it's coming out in the form of haws and he's and other funny sounds unique to each of us, which is cool. I mean, laughter is like a unique signature that we all have. Whenever we have a friend that we are really close with, you could literally just hear their laugh in your head if something happens and they're not there, but you know that they would think it was funny. And I think that's cool. It's like a fingerprint. And it is, it's moving energy right up to those higher centers, even to the point where your brain is like being tickled by the activity <laughs> of laughter and anything, any, you can laugh for any reason. And it doesn't have one thing I wanted to point out because we brought this up earlier was just that in our Western culture, there's a big difference to how laughter yoga is spreading and being received versus how maybe more easily trans transmitted it is in places like Tibet and in the East. Since we almost have like an authoritarian view on everything at this point in the United States and in westernized countries that because we have this thing called comedy and we have Netflix shows and and professional comedians and, and this and that it's like a lot of people consider themselves to not be funny or to need something funny to laugh and I know myself included there's entire days where maybe I didn't even hardly laugh once and I don't think that's good for your health we don't need permission to laugh. We don't need something to cue us to laugh. It is something we can do for any reason or no reason at all, right? Yeah, and that's exactly where I say it's powerful in developing one's practice. Practicing non-judgmental laughter is taking back your power for a very basic physiological action. And when you take back that power, you realize that I am control and in control of my own laughter. I... I'm also in control of the parameters in which I do laugh. So by taking back that power and seeing that it is something that comes from within, it is your expression, it is your own being that you are fully tapping into, you don't need the jokes. You don't need somebody else to create that within you. And there is something to be said societally about people like, oh, I could really use a laugh right now or like, tell me a joke. I like need my spirits lifted. And that's giving away your individual power that is yielding that to somebody else. Whereas the awareness of just knowing that you can laugh, you can control laugh and it helps to have someone reflect that back to you, but it's not necessary. And that all falls within the laughter yoga practice. And once one gets that experience of, oh, I can do this thing on my own whenever I want to or need to, then that starts to develop that idea of, oh, I can do that with other modalities. Oh, I can do that here. I can do that there. It's like the entry point. At least I think it's a really powerful entry point for our Western society, for those that don't necessarily have a spiritual practice. And it feels really good. <laughs> so there's also that direct kind of feedback there of if I sit and laugh for 30, 45 minutes, that's providing a physiological need in the body and it's doing lots of stuff too. Um, to go into it, it, it simulates the vagus nerve, which is one of the most important in uh, important areas of the body or parts of the body to be activated, stimulated and fully brought alive. And that goes from like your brainstem all the way down to the bottom of your spine. Is that yeah, right? That's it's like the full integration channel. And if that isn't being stimulated at a regular basis, your body's literally not firing on all cylinders. It's not fully activated. So laughter gets your abdomen moving at a rhythmic pattern, stimulates that vagus nerve, and then boom, you have full body integration. Other things that happen is when you start to laugh, your diaphragm is stimulated and it will release. The diaphragm is a really powerful muscle in your abdomen, controls your breath. And laughter is the best 
known source of release for the like best practice for releasing the diaphragm. So when you start to laugh, your diaphragm, which could be locked, a lot of people have tight diaphragms. It opens that up, allows you to fully access your breath. Your vagus nerve is stimulated. So now that access breath can actually move throughout your entire body. And you bring in some mental practice with the laughter yoga session of mindfulness. And now you're aware that you can open up the full channels in your body and you're ready to be your fullest self, be your fullest expression. And just be more comfortable because having constricted diaphragm, I can talk about that personally. I had, I mean, I have a tendency, I guess, to like keep my traumatic energy or like stuck energy right in that spot. Probably a lot of people do. And it wasn't until recently that I had uh, an experience with sort of an energetic healing burden removal thing where I connected that tightness in my chest to an actual experience I'd had. And boom, I felt an immediate swelling up of energy past that channel and up into my head. And, and it was intense. It was super intense. And I know you as a person who's been a massage practitioner and very well trained in sort of the musculature of the body and how things interact with one another. I mean, you're giving me great advice just about some other sore spots in my body earlier today. Uh, I think that it's interesting because you have a more in-depth view of what is actually happening in this process than maybe a person who's trained in laughter yoga, but that doesn't have that background in massage and understanding that energy and stagnates and is stuck and stored in muscular tension. And, you know, we could be doing diaphragmatic breathing. There's types of breath work that can help stimulate that vagus nerve. But it does sound like this is the easiest way possible to just open that up. It's really cool. Yeah, the barrier to entry is so low. And that's why when I first experienced it um, two years ago now, it was so powerful. I realized I had this kind of like internal moment where like, this is my thing. This is what I'm here to do. And that was before I had started my massage education, actually. So I began informing myself more about the physiology of the body after I had been practicing laughter yoga. And that was part of the, the level up in this past year as really diving into anatomy and realizing like, oh, that's what's happening in the body when you laugh. Oh, that's what's going on. And then there's another thing to be said about um, the other breath practices. Yes, there are other breath practices that do activate the vagus nerve, that do open the diaphragm, but they have a pretty significant barrier to entry because you have to, one, be subscribed to some spiritual practice. You have to find a teacher that's going to do that and has been trained in those specific modalities. And those breaths sometimes have drawbacks. They have, like, they can stimulate so much that they have other effects that may not be positive and they need to be taught in a very tight container. Laughter is something that everybody can do. It's pretty natural and doesn't have the drawbacks that some of those very specific forced breaths have. Yeah, I just I always come back to the hilariously simple. <laughs> yeah, I, and that's something I'm maybe not put a lot of thought into is that certain practices that are going outside of the natural range of what your body would just kind of do on its own, in, I guess, instinctual basis certain types of breathing certain types of movement exercises maybe even certain things you might do if you're like an untrained person massaging somebody else that there could be harm and help being done in that if it's not perfectly aligned not i don't want to say it's a freaky thing to realize but it is something to be mindful of is that like whenever you're taking on any new practices don't just be looking for the benefit of that practice, but also just be looking at generally like what, be honest with yourself about how something feels, I guess. And that's probably maybe the key to not stacking up too many uh, side effects. I mean, overall, I'm sure it's safer to do different types of breath work than it is to get the side effects out of like some pharmaceutical to try to solve your problems that way. But yeah, it's it's interesting. There's just so we don't get a user's manual for the body. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that might be a part of that user's manual or explanation of how things work. But then there's the whole factor that we're all unique and we're all designed in our own personal 
a, we're all designed based on our own self. <laughs> mm. So it's, it's, uh, it's complicated. It's a complicated world out there for human beings. Yeah. In my experience, every practice ha will have some kind of beneficial ability. And I see that as more of the expansion part of it. But the important part is the integration. How do you bring it home? How do you actually integrate this into your life? Um, those benefits are great, but if they're not integrated, then you're going to lose them or it could harm you. Um, and even laughter yoga has an integration. There is a guided meditation at the end where one is walked through a really calm, relaxing meditation focused on a kind of body scanning or just bringing more awareness to the body, to the effects of the laughter, allowing those energies to kind of settle down and integrate at a new plateau. Without the integration, any practice can be damaging. And I think laughter, in my experience, at least laughter is a very easily integratable experience because it's something you've been doing your entire life. And just taking that moment to be aware of like, oh, that's what that laugh did. Like, oh, wow, that feels good. That's the integration. It's easy to do. And it's almost natural when like in the process of laughter. Awesome. <laughs> I'm excited because in a couple hours, I'm actually going to finally be involved in a laughter yoga session with Michael. I've had ample opportunities. So it's my own. Uh, it's been my own choice that I haven't got to do it yet, but I've always wanted to. And this is definitely exciting to me. So I'll have more to report on and maybe in the outro to talk about what my experiences were like whenever we have accomplished that. But I know that just because you're kind of the laughter yoga guy, that's not all that you're about. And you had lots of stuff that you were excited to share with us today. So I want to let you kind of lead where we go next. It was important to me that we did talk about laughter yoga. Maybe we can return to that at some point because there's also the training that you've gone through as a practitioner that I would love to just expose people to like where to look for that in case it's something they feel called to investigate for themselves. Mm. I think that you're like Johnny Appleseed of laughter yoga over here. At least in the Southern Midwest. <laughs> At least in this area. Yeah. 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 Because I know you've already touched a lot of people in a way that they want to be able to keep rippling that out further themselves as becoming an epicenter in themselves for a very transformative experience. It looks like I've had so many friends tell me, Oh yeah, I know Michael. I did laughter yoga with him at this festival or at this yoga retreat. And it was life changing. That's always the word that gets brought up life changing. And how do you even define that? I mean, it's a pretty big deal to feel like your life is different after some, something than it was before. Even if you can't like tangibly describe what's different, it's just good work you're doing, man. I'm, I'm happy to know you. It's great that you're out there. Oh, thank you. I guess briefly touch on it. I am trained as a laughter yoga leader by the Laughter Yoga University. And in January of next year, I'll be going and getting trained as a laughter yoga instructor. And I'll be able to certify other laughter yoga leaders. So my, my plan, my mission is to get this next level of training and then share it. So more laughter yoga circles will be popping up all over Arkansas, Missouri, Texas. It's currently my like life mission right now is to spread this laughter medicine. And I'm doing it. So thank you. And I guess to, to take the reins, the, the thing that I really wanted to talk about today was an experience I had this summer. I guess technically it was the first day of fall. It was right after the, the equinox. Um, out in California, I was at the Heartland Collective in Northern California, just outside of Nevada City, at a, a micro festival called the Embodied Convergence. And this is... I can't really fully describe here what Embody was, um, other than it was a gathering of those interested in creating a new paradigm. But it was extremely emergent. It was a lot of different things focused around three core pillars of planetary healing, building sovereign systems and design, and also regeneration, just physical regeneration. So that was the event. That was the gathering. And there was very little informing what it was or what it was going to be. It's very feminine and very emergent in its nature. And one of the offerings there was this practice, celebration, or ceremony called the Humanitry. And 
And the quick download is this was the most impactful and powerful experience I have ever been through, including ayahuasca, including several really intense breath practices, including major life events that maybe weren't informed like with a spiritual thing. I got more information and had a more intense experience in 30 minutes of me being planted in living soil up to my knees and sillily playing and acting like a tree than I have in almost anything else. And that is how simple and beautiful it is, is you plant yourself like a human, you go through a small celebration kind of ceremony, and when you get out of the dirt, you plant a tree in that hole. It's so simple. It's just silly enough to work as its creator says. (laughs) And it has a beautiful, beautiful impact on the environment, the direct environment that you're actually in. So the ceremony itself, there's a couple components to it. There's one, there's digging the hole and you set intention. Um, what, What you want to release is what you think of as you strike the first shovel into the dirt and you take your first scoop out. And as you're dumping that dirt out, you what do you want to replace it with is the next thought. So that's kind of the intention setting and the calling in portion. And then you get to the actual like stepping into the whole section where you have all your loved ones that you want to be part of your celebration. You build out an altar around the space, around the hole to make it ceremonious and beautiful. Sometimes they'll plant small flowers around the space that you're going to be planted in all kinds of sacred objects. Objects are incorporated. Um, You'll sing songs. And it's just a really beautiful communal celebration of life and being one with Gaia and being children of the earth. And you get in the hole. And when you get in the hole is when you really like bring about this like strong intention of what, what you want to experience in the actual humanitarian session. Uh, in my experience, it was, I, I wish or I seek to be and experience divine love. And in a lot of really intense ways, that is exactly what happened. <laughs> but yeah, and so you get in the hole and then you have somebody else actually plant you. So the hole is filled in and they pack the soil down really, really good, just like they would be planting a tree. And then you're planted. So for most people, you're planted up to your knee. And they encourage using live, very fresh, beautiful loamy soil. Um, It's filled with microbes and that having those living microbes on your feet, which one of the most sensitive spots in your body has a physiological effect that can produce a spiritual effect, like actually create a visionary state. Um, it's pretty common with speaking with those. That's your soul, you know, that's the soul of your feet. It's also called, you know, I mean, the root word of soil is soul. Yeah. It's, it's the language is whether by design or by reflection, it tells you a lot. Yeah. And this this is just, I wanted to interject that because no, it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's relevant for sure. It was so much in my experience and many others that I've spoken with who've been through this process of having a spiritual experience as your feet are exposed to the most like raw essence of mother earth, which is like the microbes in the soil. It's that- and it's grounding on a electrical level too, to be, mm-hmm. to be connected like that. I mean, just walking around barefoot will give you not in my experience, an ecstatic feeling. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's like the next level. <laughs> yeah. So cool. And then you go into the, the ceremony from there. So you're planted You are completely supported because no matter how you try to move around, you're not going to fall over and you are also vulnerable. You can't run, you can't get up and you can't move. And so that in itself creates a a lot of emotional response and has a lot of kind of reaction effect in it just by like the design of this really simple practice. And you kind of, you go through a couple different phases. There's the watering phase where somebody that you love and trust will like take a watering can and they water. And then you get to realize like, wow, it takes a lot of water to get down to the roots of a tree. It's very practical knowledge that you get to experience firsthand. And yeah, and you can carry that on with you. And then the second phase is the swaying. That's where you really test to see how rooted you are. And 
it's astonishing like how much you can try to knock yourself over but being planted like a tree like you get it like the trees aren't knocking like just falling over because they're rooted they're grounded and and you go through the swaying phase and then there's the uh the solitary phase where everybody in the ceremony leaves and they let you be by yourself really connecting deep with the earth and like, i'm already like having these like emotions come back up mine was so powerful um yeah and you're left alone for a few minutes to just kind of commune with the earth and the surrounding trees and it's it's intense it's really intense did the trees around you like do they notice what you're doing and they're like, oh, hey, he's checking out what it's like for us. And <laughs> I mean, on an energetic level, were you picking up stuff off the trees? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> In a very deep, deep way. Um, and I'll go back through and explain my experience Great. through this. But yes, is the short answer. Yeah. And then after the solo phase, everyone comes back. You have one more celebration, like a full return communal celebration. And then you uproot and you just pull your feet out of the hole. You wiggle around enough, you get out. And then the truly beautiful part comes in where together, everybody that's part of the ceremony, you plant the tree. Or if, in my case, we did community holes where it was at a festival. So many people were planted in a single hole. We had four trees to plant. Um, all were fr fruit trees. And each person would have their the experience. They'd get unplanted. And then together at the end of the festival, we planted the trees. So it, you plant a tree, though, in the hole. That's the, the, the beauty in it. You bring all that intention, all that energy and that human connection to the land and to the tree that you're planting into the space, into the ceremony. And there's this almost empathic intellectual or beyond an intellectual connection to that tree yeah you're creating a living anchor that's permanently there that is connected to the experience that you had and the energy and the intention and every element of it there is an apple tree in northern california that to this day i feel like i can see what it's up to <laughs> that's interesting yeah and so that's that's the the actual process to give credit the human named Yanji Westfall. He's a uh, beautiful. He kind of bounces between Kauai and Northern California. He has started this practice 16 years ago under a different name, people planting people, and then evolved it into the humanitarian movement. And he's planted thousands of people from all different walks of life. He does this at festivals. He does this at private ceremonies. He d he's done like weddings before where people will get married while planted like trees. Wow. And he himself has been planted probably hundreds of times. So this, and he received this as like a direct message from spirit. Of like, this is what you're here to do. This is how it works. And it's a process that started out as that little seed and has itself grown into this beautiful blossoming tree of worldwide significance. There are people that have been planted in many continents, many countries, um, it's really popular in Africa. Um, lots of schools will be planting trees and they incorporate this. There's um, communities in, I believe, Kenya and one other country, it's not coming to me, that have really taken this and like they own this experience, this celebration, and it's grown into a full global movement. Um, lots of people in California have been planted. I hope to be a part of the first ceremonies in Arkansas this coming spring, maybe even this like fall into winter time, if we can get the, get everything worked out, but it's a global movement and it's, it's beautiful because it one increases one's personal connection to the earth. It has a spiritual component to it and just being ceremony and being a ceremonious action. And then you actually physically plant a tree. So it's healing the planet, helping to undo the damage that humanity has done to Gaia and it's all done in such a beautiful, loving, and <laughs> kind of silly way. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> just like laughter yoga, hilariously simple. Mm -hmm. I want to get you to, like you said, describe some of what it was like for you personally when you went through this. But mm -hmm. I just want to point out how this is a conversation we were having before we got on mics that some of us have a personal design that involves getting a very direct message from spirit, like a download, as you put it, that is 
This is what you're supposed to do. Just like this, here it is all laid out. I know multiple people that have received direct instructions on how they do what they do as energy workers or light workers or whatever, that it was a perfectly articulated plan just handed over to them while they were maybe in an ayahuasca session or through a dream or whatever the case may be. But you and I are kind of more the type that add our energy towards a pra towards practices and ideas that already exist. Not that we are capable of innovating or develop our developing our own thing. I just want to point this distinction out between different types of people because there's value in both. And I want to encourage those of us that maybe have wanted and been waiting for what's my big earth changing download going to be? What am I going to innovate that totally changes the paradigm and flips everything into order, right? Well, it might not necessarily be your path to go that route, maybe, because there's there's so much already out there that there's so many genius people already developing these downloads into full-fledged practices that it's also very, a very valid path to amplify something that you already find. And either way, just realize that like technically there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's ever been is already there. Mm -hmm. So you're not less to be an amplifier or a generator towards something that someone else downloaded. We need all types in this like human peer to peer network of information distribution. I just wanted to point out the relevance of that because it is something you can hold against yourself if you're not like the inventor of X or Y and it's not, it's not valid. You don't need to, you don't need that. I guess there's so much that we can do in a bunch of roles and capacities and it's all needed. And I would go further to say that the need is that there are more people reflecting these practices because each person that takes on, they do make it their own. You add your expression to it. You're evolving that practice. So my flavor and take on laughter yoga is evolving <laughs> laughter yoga in a specific way that's making it more palatable to people in this area. I'm not fully sure why that's happening, but laughter yoga has come through the Arkansas area before and it didn't quite stick. But now that it's coming through in this expression or my expression, it's resonating with more people. So that's beautiful. And then same thing with the humanity. Humanity, every single person that is planted, every single person that goes through a ce celebration and a ceremony you're adding your own experience to that, and you're also informing the practice itself on subtle ways that it could change, and sometimes significant ways to change and upgrade. So I think that every person should explore as many practices as they can. There are those kind of, I think it's a smaller camp of those who get those downloads, who get those practices, but everybody needs to be trying out lots of different things, in my experience, in my opinion, I guess. But to jump into my experience of the humanity, Wow. So <laughs> I guess to start was I um, I had this very intense feeling that I needed to be planted exactly when I was. I had been observing the ceremony and they were, people were being planted continuously throughout this six day event. And I got planted on the second to last day. Um, it was something that I know I wanted at a desire level. I wanted to be planted. I wanted to go through that experience, but I didn't have that like full body. Yes. Until the moment when it started to happen, it started to roll, roll forward. And there's a lot of things that kind of led up to that. But where I'm going to start was I knew that this needed to happen and, or it was happening rather. And so I started and even as I was getting ready to start planted, things started to get really weird and shifting. Like I had this kind of like fluffy kind of glowing nature to just everything that I was seeing. It was like I was almost in a dreamlike state. And I also started to see things get fuzzy around the edges. They totally do. <laughs> I know what you're and talking when you're about. about to break through those edges, things get really fuzzy. And yeah, and it was I, I feel like I was having a spiritual experience before I even got planted. Um, I set the parameters of my ceremony. That's another part of the humanity is um, you are encouraged to make it your own celebration. There is no right or wrong way to do it. Um, there are a couple key components to it, but you are invited to make it your own. 
And how I chose to make it my own was I wanted to observe two guidelines. The first guideline was that uh, be silly or at least respect the silliness. And this was at like a period in time where I was really playing with the idea of I, my expression, is living the silliest timeline. And we can go into that more, but it plays into laughter yoga and just kind of like my most expressive self is when I'm being fully embracing my silliness. So be or respect the silliness. And then the second rule was whenever a new person arrived in the ceremony, every single person was asked to look the person in the eyes and tell them, I love you. And share that information with anybody else that joined. Um, in opposition to most of the plantings, mine was done at a time during the festival when not very many people were free floating. There was a regeneration project done for, uh, throughout the whole week and we, it was kind of like crunch time where most people were working on the physical project that we as a festival had set out to accomplish. So lots of people were like working really hard. I could hear the music and like I could feel this like communal energy of like this village coming together and really like getting stuff done as I was kind of on the, this outskirts, like going through this really deep and solemn practice. Um, one of the thoughts that went through my head, which I didn't like hold on to, but it definitely came through a few times was that I was a Christ figure about to go through my crucifixion. And of course, in the silliest timeline, it would be something like getting planted like a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, all you have to do is stick, raise your arms out and you're a human cross. So that happened multiple times in the experience. Yeah. And so I had this like very solemn feeling of like I was walking to this death experience as I approached. And I had uh, three people helping me in my ceremony. Um, one was a friend of mine who I had just, well, two of them were friends that I had just met at that event. And one was another person who I dearly, dearly love and was very grateful that she was able to be there. First person, he had this very monk-like kind of expression to himself. Um, very stoic uh, servitude was his like highest goal. And he was completely open to reflect whatever I chose to do and was fully embracing the silliness. It was beautiful to have him supporting. The second person was kind of an interesting, like she just happened to be there when it was time for me to get planted and showed up and was like ready to help and serve. But that person had actually been my ceremonious, I'm air quoting, my ceremonious wife in a uniting the masculine and the feminine ceremony that was done earlier that day. Without going too much into that, we did this process of separating the masculine and the feminine and then reunifying them in a ceremonial practice. And in that process, we just kind of randomly paired up in masculine energies and feminine energies and did a walk from our ceremony ground to the kiva on the land, like a ceremonial site. And this person who was helping support me in my ceremony was the woman who I was paired up with to be my feminine counterpart in that ceremony. So it felt like I had my like monk best friend and my wife there to, <laughs> to plant me. And then the third person was an elder friend of mine. Uh, her name's Pookie. She is one of the most loving expressions I have ever encountered. And I dearly, dearly love you. If you're listening, I love you, Pookie. <laughs> um, but yeah, and she led the ceremony. So I went into my, my practice, I set my own intentions, and I chose to amplify silliness. That was a very core component of it. And then my intention as I got into the hole was to be and experience divine love. So I got in the hole, I got planted, and as my, my ceremonious wife began packing the dirt around me, I got my first message. And that was, I will never again park under the roots of a tree or on the roots of a tree under the canopy because as i felt the dirt compacting down on my feet that pressure gets amplified so it just like really quickly like registered in my head like trees don't like heavy weights on their roots don't park a car under like on a tree's roots like don't do it just don't do it and so that was like a really quick practical knowledge of experiencing what it's like to be a tree and knowing like oh young trees like it's really important to not walk on their roots or, or even older trees, don't park a heavy object. So practical knowledge coming through. And then the ceremony started. Pookie began singing songs. 
um, mostly worship songs. She leads a church service in her community in St. Louis. And she's just such a powerful, powerful channel and powerful singer. And one of the songs she sang was like, I release, I surrender and just like soaring harmony. And the group of us joined in and sang together. And that was the, the catalyst, I guess, in the entire experience. That was when things really started to like ramp up. I was singing at the fullest of my breath, the fullest of my voice. And like, I wanted to be in that experience, but there was something much bigger coming through me. And I felt that energy moving through me as I was literally singing at the top of my lungs. I release, I surrender. And it just happened to be the song she chose. And so that got me very open and heart-based. Like I felt like my heart was just wide open at that moment. And then she went into something. She had been leading ceremonies throughout the week. But at this moment, she went into what I have since integrated as a Gaia channel. And she looked me dead in the eyes and using her just powerful feminine presence and connection to the Mother Earth. She began channeling Gaia directly through me. And it was gratitude and it was love. That was the purest expression um, the things that she was saying was like, the mother thanks you for leaving this offering for coming and connecting yourself with the earth for feeling the soil through the soles of your feet, the soul of the earth coming through your soul. And she just worked through this really beautiful process of explaining at a spiritual level what I was going through and the connection I was forming with earth while staring me dead in the eyes. And this is where like my visionary experience started. So I had already had this kind of like glowing external effect going on. And I had this like excitement throughout my body. And as I was looking into her eye, one eye in particular, it was her, her right eye. I was looking through it. I was still fully aware of like my surroundings, but her eye opened up and inside her pupil, it turned into this little like portal, like essentially like a, a screen that I could see through and see into. And I entered into her eye. I was like entering into like an energetic or spirit realm. So I could still fully aware of my physical existence. I could see within that eye, my energy body. And so like I went through that and then was essentially standing right behind her in an, an energy body state now. And I was aware that my physical limitation was no longer there. My physical body was planted in the earth, but I was free to roam as I chose. And I had this kind of like golden light around me. Um, if like even my physical body or the representation of what would look like a physical body had this like gold kind of glow to it and it was non-physical. And I immediately intuitively knew what I was doing and where I was going. I was planted facing, facing the West in the California coast or like close to the California coast. I was actually up in the mountains, but I jumped across California essentially following this like rainbow path. So there was a rainbow from where I was to like where I was supposed to land. And I jumped and flew across the Central Valley of California, across the Cascade and landed on the beach. And from there continued like a straight path. As I jumped that goal or that rainbow left this like gold light behind me. And there was a collection of gold energy where my physical body had remained. And so I connected that to this, to the beach and then continued to walk into the ocean. I walked through like along the bottom of the ocean all the way down. Um, and it was like kind of like a quick process. Like time was very much dilated and different. I was able to walk all the way to like the deep depths, like abyssal zone of the ocean in a matter of seconds. And as I got to the darkness, like the true darkness of the ocean, these sea monsters began to manifest around me. They started to show up and it started as this like dark cloud and then grew into like, there was a giant angler fish and there was this like octopus, like kind of cephalopodish monster. And then there was some like giant shark kind of creature and they were terrifying at a like intellectual level, but I was open and I was not scared of them. And I just like, I kept standing, standing tall, standing strong and continued to walk. I didn't break my stride. And by not showing fear, to those entities, they fairly quickly vanished. And it was really like, as I was aware of them, 
and also aware that I held no fear of them, my gold light expanded more and they were repelled by it. And I'm still leaving this little tiny gold like line. I'm just kind of following almost like a monorail of a faint light. And as I walk through that, it left a much brighter light, golden path essentially behind me. And I walked all the way down through. So the monsters are gone. I've now reached the bottom of the ocean, like deep, deep, dark depths. And in front of me, that little faint line opened up into this. It started as like kind of like a blur of gold light and then turned into this full angelic golden gate. And I saw that in front of me and I just kept walking. I, also that I wasn't stopped in astonishment. I just accepted it and continued to walk. And that golden gate, as I like got close to it, it faded and started to shift and change. So it, was, it wasn't like I was walking through a gate. It actually, the, the light changed and the way that it was presenting itself, it turned into a refraction of a light source that was on the bottom of the ocean. And so that refraction through the dark water turned into this, at one point was a big bright bubble. And as I got closer, it was a lava vent on the bottom of the ocean. I could see this lava vent and the line went up to the edge of the lava vent and then down through it. And so I just kept walking and then went down into the lava. And when I entered this lava vent that was, was Golden Gate, was lava vent, I went through a really intense experience. This was probably the most intense physical sensation I went through. So I'm still fully aware of my physical body. I'm still looking Pookie in the eyes, but I'm also at this energetic level going through a lava vent at the bottom of the ocean. And I felt my energy body not fit. So my, my physical manifestation of my body in that energetic realm was able to go in but my actual energetic field was pulled back and stayed in the lava and like burnt away. And there was the sensation of like burning of like searing going on. It wasn't painful, but it was intense. It was like a full spinal tingling sensation. And my energy dissipated across the entire planet. I felt my energy just like pulse and cover the entire planet. Like I had reunited my energy with Gaia like given it to her and my awareness had gone through the lava. And then I was floating in this kind of like pearly white realm. There was nothing there besides just bliss and whiteness, like pure white. And it was like a pearly kind of like swirly mixing white, but that was that. And as I entered that, as my awareness entered that area, that space, Pookie finished the channel she finished this, that section of the ceremony. She moved. I was fully back in my body and I was very aware that my energy had shifted. Um, whereas before I was feeling like I was a singular body and a being, and I was aware of my aura, like my energetic field, there was no limit to my energetic field. I felt one with the earth. I felt my energy was indecipherable from the people that were standing before me, the trees that were around me, trees that were very far in my awareness and even other places on the planet. And that it was almost alarming at the first because I wasn't able to immediately integrate what was going on. It was like, whoa, this is different. Whoa, this is overwhelming. And then it started an emotional reaction. So I started taking in what I have now integrated to be the emotional energy of the planet itself and my direct surrounding environments. So you asked if I like was aware of trees or anything. I was very aware of trees. There was one large oak tree that was directly in front of me. And it was funny, it wouldn't really interact with me until I dropped the label of calling it an oak tree and just accepted it as being. And then it started to like really inform me. And it was like grateful that I was there. And it was so excited because it like sitting at its base was the apple tree that was going to be planted. And it had started to kind of build awareness that a tree was going to be planted. It was going to have like another, another being around it. And it was like really grateful. And it also had this underlying pain. Uh, at that time in Northern California, they were experiencing a really intense drought and there had been some rain, but still there was a lot of moisture needed to get back to like a normal level. And so the tree was also exhibiting some level of pain in its experience that it didn't have the water it needed to be thriving. And that became really readily apparent and 
Yeah. And then like the watering came through and that was like, there was, it wasn't an envy, but it was like so grateful that I got to experience watering because of how like valuable that was at the time. So when I was watered, the tree was just pouring love and gratitude into me that I got to experience that in the situation that I was like, like almost how like unique that was for the environment and the terrain. And yeah. And we continued to sing, sing songs and at th that point, after the, the vision like faded away was when the silliness really started to come through. So my my monk friend and I started to go back and forth. Um, I like to drop into freestyle rhyming and I call it my like my fairy channel uh, where it's a like, very playful, very lighthearted rhyming scheme, um, almost like a Dr. Seuss like story. And it was completely uninhibited coming right through. Uh, I connect that a lot when I'm comfortable in nature and connecting to like trees and like the energy of nature is when that channel opens up for me. And I was in it. I was rhyming and it was super silly and it was at a macroscopic scale. I was talking about in the rhymes, I was talking about like earth and how much she loves us, but also how she's not really appreciating how we're like cutting down her trees and burning her. And like there was always this like playful sting to the things I was saying, like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all love. Yeah, 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 except for the industrial, like, tragedy that is happening on the planet as well. It always came back to this, like, playful, loving spirit, but there was also that heaviness to it that was in the rhyme. And we were going back and forth in that. And uh, Yanji, the creator, he had been through a kind of difficult experience in the, the planting before and was emotionally charged and he came up and he's like okay it's time for the uh, the solo the solitary ex experience and i was still in this like rhyming playful completely like disconnected from the direct experience much more like macroscopic focus and i just was like i didn't know how to communicate to him at a cognitive level that i was doing something and that i would get to that section but i was taking my time and he was kind of impatient and so like rightfully so he'd been planting people all week and there are lots of explanations we've since like really dove in deep about this, but yeah. And he, he got upset and that created like the next major shift for my experience. So I went from being this like embodiment of playful, silly joy, like love to the deepest and most sorrow like filled I have ever experienced. It was I was completely unhinged. And so my emotional experience, as much as it was peaking, just tanked as soon as that happened. And he was upset and basically he told me like, okay, you go ahead when you're done, just unplant yourself. I'm, I'm done. And he left the ceremony and that triggered this emotional release that I, I said in the moment, like I haven't cried like that since I was a kid. And that like my friend who was like supporting me was like, whoa, <laughs> like he kind of pointed at me and was like, what was that? And so it was like, there was a lot of childhood abandonment kind of issues with my own father that were coming through. And it was deep emotional trauma processing that just started spontaneously coming through me. I was like, I was still planted, so I couldn't like fall on the ground, but I was essentially like crumpling physically and just weeping and sobbing. And I talked to Yanji about it. I've talked to other people. That's not so typical to have an intense like sadness release, but it does happen. So that's probably a good thing. It was a really good thing in hindsight. Like after integrating it, it was and during the moment it was intense and it felt like the entire weight of the planet was on me. And that also shifted where my planetary awareness, where I was being light and playful about the dark stuff, I was now consumed in the darkness. I was having visions pop up of Brazil and the rainforest being on fire, of deforestation, of mining operations that I had never physically seen that I've since gone and looked up and had a very clear vision of these different mining operations all across South America and lots of deforestation in Africa. Um, there was a lot of oil mining things that were going on in China or oil drilling in China and Russia, like very planetary awareness, like these are the hot spots that are causing the suffering of the collective. And if you look at the macrocosmic microcosmic thing, if you stop those major events that actually would probably, or at least the way it was informed to me, stopping those things or mitigating those would massively heal the emotional content of humans 
like the collective humanity. Um, and it, it was really, really laser focused on these things that were coming up. But I went through this emotional release of just like crying and, and not being able to really support myself. And then my, my supporter came in and he hugged me and that helped. And that brought me back into the silliness and I would be like rhyming and kind of like not joking, but like the lightness would come. And then as soon as like the hug would end, I would go right back into the depths of just like sobbing and finally got to a point where (laughs) he was like asking me, my supporter was asking me like, can I help you in any way? Like, could I get you some tea? It was kind of cold. The sun was starting to go down. I was like, yeah, bring me some tea. And then my, my other supporter stayed with me and she was still in the area. So I wasn't totally alone. He came back with the tea and I had also at one point really committed to being a tree Like I really wanted this to be like a real experience, not so much of just like a human planted, but I wanted to be a tree. And so when he handed me the tea, I'm like, I can't even drink this because I'm a tree. And I poured it down at my feet and dropped the mug and just kept (laughs) crying. Like, and it was one of those things where it was funny, but it wasn't me. It was like this higher level thing coming through me of just like being super silly in my sorrow. And so I set the parameters of be silly or respect the silliness. And like the container I set completely took over, I guess is the way I can explain that. And then it got to the point where I wanted to be alone. It was the, like, that was why Yanji had got upset was because I was supposed to be at the sol- the solitary part and he wanted to get there, like to experience that. And I was still playing with my friends. And then I got to the point of, I wanted to be alone. I wanted to be left alone and I didn't want anybody to see me or feel me. Um, and so he left actually, he like took 15 steps back and sat down and was, and I, I was like, I can still feel you. <laughs> and he was like kind of meditating and he's like, Oh, okay. And then he actually got up and went and engaged with other people and fully disengaged from me. And that was when the true depth of the sadness hit me, the pain, the suffering. It was, I, I, there's like a want in me to not recommend this for anybody because of how intense it was. But if you really want to check in with how guy is doing, like open yourself up to this experience and it'll come through. And it's, it's pretty dire. She's there's other ways. There's many ways. Like I know exactly I've turned, I've opened it up before Yeah. in other ways, like on, on psilocybin, the first time it happened, I just spontaneously decided to check in with Gaia with the earth and be like, how does it feel to be the, the total earth? And I put my hands in the dirt. I kneeled. And as soon as I mentally or internally opened up the channel, I was immediately slammed with the heaviest, hardest feelings of suffering and pain and sadness that I've ever, ever felt. And it was so intense that I had to like turn it off pretty quick to to feel okay because i was you know i was at a festival or something i was trying to not start bawling uncontrollably for a while yeah (laughs) but i want to point out because this just kept coming up in my head your visionary experience is so so interesting It, it informs a lot of mythology especially in your personal ancestry as a kind of a nordic you know white guy or whatever but our both of us being from that i guess heritage or lineage we have the Nordic mythology in our history. And there's this concept of the world tree that humanity is positioned somewhere on this greater tree or that Midgar or the realm we're in, the dimension we're in is part of a greater tree. But also there's the concept of the rainbow bridge and you took a rainbow bridge. There's alchemy that's part of the Western magical tradition. There's a a famous phrase as one of the steps of the alchemical experience is to travel to the center of the earth to find the philosopher's stone or it has something to do with the creation of the philosopher's stone. And finally, so of course that seems like it happened for you. It seems like you went there. It seems like you took the rainbow bridge to the gods, if you will, not the gods as in, I think, I don't think there's external deities and gods, but like you went to this, place that's really close to source or at least to the source of uh, the next biggest platform out from yourself, which is the planet. And uh, man, I I just, I found this really fascinating. You're talking about the sort of monstrous sea creatures, the cephalopods and artists that we both 
we're talking about earlier, Hakan Hissim, he, a visionary artist that's been on the show a few times. He's talked about experiences going up and out and leaving from like going into the heavens, so to speak, into the vault and it being like an ocean or a sea. And there's this as above, so below element of alchemy. You went through the ocean floor, but he was talking about seeing the same types of Cthulhu-esque cephalopod creatures totally bent on trying to make him fear them. And that sort of, by, by not being afraid of them, he is able to, I don't know, command them to give him information. <laughs> and very similar experiences in different modalities. I think he was probably doing DMT to reach that place. But overall, the, all you have to do is be a tree. I guess all you have to do is be a tree. You're already a tree. It makes me really think about how we see other life forms versus what their experience of life is. And that just because a tree is this stationary, mostly static thing that's just there swaying in the dirt and not seeming to go anywhere, for all we know, it's got a deep-rooted consciousness connection to the entire planet and can travel along these roads, these telluric pathways, ley lines, if you will, or maybe more freely than that. And, cr you know, cross huge distances in their perception or feel connected to places very far away. And besides trees, there's also cats. You know, they sleep all the time. Maybe they're going on astral journeys. I've always thought that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I have lived with many Zen masters, all of them cats. Thank you, Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> But to, directly speaking to that thought of trees being connected and having these communication pathways, we do know that from a scientific sense, the mycelial networks that connect tree roots to other tree roots and entire forests together, those are communication pathways. They use mushroom mycelium, mycelium to communicate and share resources. Um, this is something that happens in every ecosystem and it is a very clear, established path of communication for trees. In the soil. In the soil, yeah. And so if you look at the macrocosmic, microcosmic, that's another layer of communication, connection, and individuality um, that is in nature. Um, it's like the internet of nature. It is, exactly. Yeah. And... And it connects different species all together, too. It, so in that, too, on top of that, the speaking where I was in my experience too, of like going through this depth of sorrow, that was also when I started to have this very expanded feeling of like, there were no humans directly around me. I could feel that there was not a single human that was focused on me directly, um, except for Yanji, who was upset with me. And with that upset feeling, that was fully dictating the experience I was going through, which was this like pain and sorrow and suffering that was resonating with Gaia. She was like, Oh yeah, I feel that too. And so she was amplifying what my experience was at this personal level at a macrocosmic level. And I started to scream in agony, just screaming at the top of my lungs. Thankfully, most of the people who were at this festival were busy and listening to loud music. I was literally in my own bubble and I was just screaming out, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and like, forgive me. And like directed faintly at Yanji, but I actually was having these visions of myself being Christ on the cross. And I was holding my arms straight out, dangling, and my head was down and I would just like roll my head up and I would scream, like, forgive me. And then I would like crumple again as I felt like my energy was being fully drained out and I was dying. And finally, Pookie, who was sitting next to Yanji, like took on her most motherly tone. It's like, go talk to him. And I was aware of that, but at a cognitive level, not so much at like a full experiential level. And he got up and he walked over to me and he threw up his hands and this is not what it's about. This is not what the humanity is about. It's, like, it's about being open to love. It's not about needing love. It's not about needing anybody. It's about being open to receiving the love that is already there. And I looked at him and I said, but I, how can love not be love? I don't feel loved. And he said, what do you mean? I love you, bro. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I love you. So Yanji was not at the beginning of the ceremony. He had actually walked up. He was kind of preoccupied and walked up. 
he had never joined in that one key moment of ceremony in my my parameters, which was look somebody in the eye and tell them I love you. He did, and instantly the sorrow was over. It was gone. I was right back into this silly, laughter, loving feeling. I felt connected to him. He gave me a hug. It felt great. And he's like, I'm going to give you a couple more moments and then we'll come back together. And then that had completely shifted. I was no longer stuck in the sorrow. I was no longer feeling the pain of the earth. I wasn't having the visions of the planet burning. I was seeing beautiful gardens. I was experiencing myself in this connection with the tree. I was very aware of every body and every being around me, including the plants. And I had this expanded regional awareness. Like I could see over the hills that I was looking at. This is like a very hilly area of California. I could see over the hills. I could see trees that were maybe a little bit more stark in their personality. I was seeing like plants that were like dying because of drought. And it was just love pouring out from me. It was awareness and raw awareness. I believe like in my experience is love. And I was loving my environment and a really deep ancestral connection to this land. My mother grew up very close, like less than 30 minutes away from this land, like where I was specifically planted in California. And five generations of my family on my mother's side had lived in that area. So there was this like, as much as, you know, a white person in like invader or whatever you want to call it, colonial can have a connection to land. I had that connection, that space, and it felt generational in my connection there. I was fading into experiences of seeing places that I had never personally seen before but in my like assumptive experience, in my like, intuitive experience, this was tapping into things from my like, DNA, from my genealogical line of sacred spaces that were sacred to them, like places to go and relax and calm down. The lake that I was planted right next to was man-made. My mom was one of the first people to ever ski across that lake. Like, there was this deep connection. And I had this full, wide awareness of the space I was in. And was later confirmed, I drove through that the next day when I was leaving the ground, or it was a couple days later, but as I was leaving the grounds, and I was seeing places, physically seeing them, that were exactly in line with the visions I had had while planted. So it was like confirming that. And then I had this really intense energetic visionary experience where I had a Merkaba emerge from my heart, spinning, it expanded and shot up into the air and was floating really high above me. And there was already several of these objects like Merkaba spinning objects in that space, specifically over the Heartland Collective land. And they all merged together into this one bigger one, shot a blinding white laser beacon down through me, through the earth and up into the heavens. And were just emanating light. And then this connected in with another vision I had had when I was in Thailand in a Tantra spiral meditation, which is the most potent meditation practice in the Tantra lineage that I was studying. And in that experience, I saw the light grid or the ley lines of the planet light up as beacons. And in that, I had this superimposed kind of global map of the planet and the beacons of light. And I got like an update to it, essentially like tapping into the, the, the Gaia mainframe and was able to see like, oh, these had shifted a little bit. Oh, that well of darkness is a little bit smaller. Oh, that one's bigger. And I could see the map, like the energetic map of the planet, and then also see the beacon of light that I was like really powering on and charging up was getting brighter. And that connected in with a couple other things. And I could see like, oh, my like nomadic path that I take from Arkansas through Colorado, Oregon, California is connecting these beacons in this big revolutionary ring. And like I had a deeper understanding of like my path, like quite literally my path. And yeah, and then that faded away as more people started to converge. And then the, the, solo t the solitary part was over and people started coming back and I was like giggling and dancing. There was like, there was also this moment right before people started showing up that I could hear a song playing at the kitchen that was at my back and they were like listening to music and cooking and having a great time. And I was like, finally, like, oh, there's music going on. I love music. And I started dancing and playing. And I could feel like the joy in my body going down into the soil and cleansing out the soil. Like there had been a lot of pain there, specifically like the experience before me, the person who was planted before me was had a very painful experience. And 
I was like cleansing out that and I was cleansing out the pain I had put into the soil and it was like just filling this area with joy as I was dancing and just having a beautiful time. And then I got to sway like a tree and it was just silly and innocent and beautiful. People came back in, we sang a few songs and it was over. Then I got out of the ground and <laughs> yeah. And now there's an apple tree planted in that hole. Um, and I still feel like I can, I can still tap into that like energetic grid and I have a connection to that space, that land, um, that direct area that I, I accessed. And then also specifically to that one tree. Like I feel like I am soul bonded in a way to that tree. Yeah. Your soul is forged into that soil soil. I want to just say too, like to rewind a little bit, cause you've had so much to tell us about the part where you were almost like inconsolably sorrowful, right? Mm -hmm. I know you personally that you're not someone that's so, I guess, in the crowd mentality and non-individualistic that you would be unable to feel happy or okay or satisfied without someone else's approval. Like, I know you're not somebody that would just literally crumple if somebody disapproved of them. Right. I mean, you're heret yeah. you're a heretical being by your by your human design. We talked about this earlier. So going clashing with what others think you should be doing doesn't necessarily hurt your feelings. Right. Yeah. So what you were describing in this, like channeling the hard stuff th from the earth and transmuting that through your silliness and uh, like cleansing energetically the region from the previous person's difficulty. This is I've had this kind of theory for a while about what light workers do or healers do for Gaia being a lot like how a human can pick up a black tourmaline or a shungite or some kind of grounding and cleansing clearing stone and use that to balance their energy and discharge some excess heaviness into that stone. I think that we are capable of doing that for Gaia like we are human tourmalines, <laughs> human black tourmalines. And we have all these minerals and elements in our body and we have a crystalline structure in our body in the form of just the water itself, let alone the other minerals. So I think there's something to that. And what you've described, I've had miniature experiences like it, but just never quite taking on so much all at once. And uh, as you described, and I've also never been planted like a tree. So soon. <laughs> <laughs> soon. Oh, you're planning on, you're going to bury me alive with, no, I'm just kidding. Up to the knees. Up just up to the knees. If you're consenting, I would I, love to. I consent. Yeah. Yay, that sounds great. Let's do it. Universe episode from the ground. <laughs> but to speak on that directly though. Yeah. That was that very much in line with my experience. Um, there was a, very distinct layer of macrocosm in the microcosm with the sorrow of Yanji representing this fatherly figure, um, Puki representing the mother who kind of like urged him to like look past the, what was directly in his system and see the impact it was having on me and me as the son feeling abandoned. So there's like the Christ story going on there, like abandoned another father. And then there's also like a deeper like Gaia story of being abandoned by man. And humanity in general has a pretty consistent abandonment trauma with their fathers, mm -hmm. fathers more than mothers. Mothers can, of course, abandon their children. But what passes for fathership in our society pretty much around the world is also definably neglectful or you distant. Say, distant. Distant is like the way I felt it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that perfectly informs the way that I was experiencing feeling. And then also to jump back, that that deep depth of sorrow is not a normal experience for me. It's something that I've been in a few moments, but I said in that moment, like, whoa, I haven't cried like that since I was a kid. And in that moment, that was when my supporter friend was like, whoa, he could feel like the depth of that statement of like, that was a deep release in my own being. And also that was a deep release at a more like expanded for the level. fractal. Yeah. For the fractal itself. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. everything we do is a reflection of that entire fractal. So mm -hmm. you, yeah, you're making huge progress in our collective abandonment trauma. And another way of looking at this on a metaphysical 
level, but also that's that's also physical is our left brain, right brain. The left brain, right brain relationship is at the heart of what our dynamics between masculine and feminine express like in the reality and humanity's issues with their right brain and left brain and the conflicts that arise there and just the like the way that the relationship between them works is uh, reflective of the imbalance that's occurring on the planet that's harmful to the planet for uh, for example the, your left brain we, we all kind of take the left brain. We, a lot of us assume that the left brain being like the masculine, logical, reason oriented side of our being is what we are sort of viewing reality through. It's, it's our conscious mind, if you will, whereas the right brain, the feminine side is the more expansive, um, dissolving type of integrating side, like people that have had ex strokes where their left brain was shut down or damage will lose the boundaries between themselves and the world mm. and feel in a very psychedelic way like that. But what is really interesting about the dynamic as it is in humanity today is that the right brain is actually where all your sensing and your feeling is. And <laughs> your left brain is you, what you think about what you feel two different things, entirely different things. So what is occurring in our in our minds is literally that the left brain is watching what the right brain is feeling. And the left brain is thinking about what the right brain is feeling and making decisions about what that means. But at the end of the day, it equates to a keyhole view of reality is what is all we've got. We are because the left brain is this sort of dividing there's nothing wrong with it in itself, but it's, it divides, it looks at things in pieces and parts, and it's not the whole. It means that we, if we're in a, a balance of our consciousness towards the left brain being the dominant or the masculine being dominant or a sort of patriarchal paradigm on the planet, we experience only a sliver of nature, only a sliver of ourself. And that sliver is actually like a story about a sliver. It's not even the sliver. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the more feeling that we can do, the more we're actually experiencing the real thing of, of what life is, of what the energy of consciousness is. Consciousness is feeling. Then everything else is like an interpretation or a thought or something. It's artifice. It's not that there's a, isn't a place for it, but I think that it's at the heart of the dynamics of the world right now that the left brain sort of seeks to control and filter out the feelings that it doesn't want to feel or doesn't want to think about. Mm -hmm. It goes, it's a deny, it denies the emotions of the heart or of, you know, the self. And whenever we do that for too long, we end up having the repressed child we have repressed feelings all the way back to childhood and we do need to actually feel them it's a simple releasing stuck energy is as simple as actually feeling it and that goes for what would act, what would heal the planet if everybody felt what you felt about how the planet feels about the what humanity does to it then things would most certainly change really fast but we don't feel it we just intellectualize it and yeah. it's a there's a big difference and the way that my experience proceeded after being planted very much enforces everything you just said um so i got out of the dirt and i <laughs> one of the first conversations i had was with somebody and they brought up something about childhood like really quickly it was a dream that they had had and there was like this very faint theme of abandonment in it. And I fully went back into that experience. I was like so opened up and I like started to cry. And they're like, and then I realized I had this rational thought come in. I'm like, oh, I'm still really expanded right now. Let's let's talk about this later. And so that was like the the masculine left brain. The editor. Yeah, coming in to support and be like, we don't need to feel that right now. This isn't the proper container. And so I like removed myself from it. And I still did go through that again. We were able to unpack it a little bit later, but for days, more like a week and a half, 
after that experience, I was having a very difficult time establishing where my own boundaries were, where my, like the boundaries of my own being. So I went from Northern California directly down to LA. <laughs> Dangerous place to be unaware of your own boundaries. <laughs> exactly. I was walking down the street and I would see people and I would have like a full information, like full download of what they were experiencing in that moment. And sometimes it was good. Sometimes it was really uncomfortable. And I still had this like golden light aura around me and like this full like loving embrace. So I was able to like handle it quite well. But there were some interactions that were very confusing because the person that I was interacting with at a very like surface level wasn't acknowledging and owning the feelings that were present in their field. And I was fully feeling them and like reflecting them to them. And it was really uncomfortable for them because they were becoming aware of what they weren't feeling. This happened many times. And for me, I wasn't even quite aware of what was going on. I thought I was just being me, but I was reflecting so deeply this other person. And then I'd walk away and be like, why was that such a strange experience? Because I like until later and I actually was able to integrate, I wasn't realizing that I wasn't necessarily being my own expression. I was reflecting their expression was my re in that moment. My expression had gotten so expanded. I was just a mirror. Yeah, I experienced that often, especially in psychedelic states. But this is it is kind of risky. I'm not saying you shouldn't open up to being the mirror for others in your life. But and you should definitely not be afraid of this. But I guess I just am trying to say that the, the Christ figure gets killed by other humans in the mythology, like repeatedly. It always happens. We mm -hmm. kill those people that try to take us out of denial. And so it's uh, that's why you feel uncomfortable, because while in today's day and age, you're probably almost definitely not going to get murdered because of being Christ like. Luckily, we've evolved quite a long way. People are going to feel uncomfortable around you. And some people are going to actually have an aversion to you if you're a mirror and, and uh, that's okay as well, because no one's going to make any progress, any change, any self-awareness, any discovery until they're ready for it. You can give them every key. You can give them the skeleton master key that opens every lock and they'll still, they will refuse to put it in the keyhole and you can't, you can't change that. So uh, it is, I guess part of the journey to, learn about your own containers, your own boundaries and your own limits. We feel so restricted by the limiting forces in the reality. We might rage against the Saturnian or the Kronos type of energy that keeps us in certain patterns or gives us time bound obligations or, uh, you know, we have to wait. Even losing weight requires waiting. You can't even do that instantly like all, all of that can be really frustrating but whenever you do have a full boundary disillusion experience th there's a part of it where eventually you realize okay i do need to start putting things in containers i do need to have things in the right place and that's actually kind of like the core of alchemy is having things in their right place knowing where to put them and even in your body, having the right physical elements in the right place, in the right ratios to be for the machine to work really nicely. And that's the, a unique to each person thing, too, because we're each in our own completely one of a kind vehicle. Yeah. And for me, what was the most important like piece to hold on to while I was in that expanded state for several days was to not identify with what I was mirroring the confusion and the the difficulty that I was experiencing only really arose when I was trying to identify as what I was mirroring, what I was experiencing. And it took, I think it was like six days after the planting that I finally, I was sleeping on the side of a mountain in New Mexico, completely by myself, like miles away from another human on the earth, like literally sleeping on the earth. And that after that night of sleeping on the ground, I woke up the next day like, oh, I'm me again. I was able to like reestablish my boundaries and things. It was like I finally had let that experience go back to the earth and my boundaries came back. And it was like really cold, too, which I feel like that like helped inform that. Like I was 
really tightly bound into myself as I was sleeping and that like coming back into myself, literally like re like going into the fetal position and being like reborn in a way brought me back into like the boundary awareness and being able to put myself back together and interact with humans in what society deems a normal way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a useful skill that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Well, I recently cut my hair just for that same reason. I got short hair so that I could be more trustworthy looking to old people and squares. <laughs> Actually, no, I did it just so I could take quicker showers and because, you know, there's a lot of ways to ground and purify your energy and water is a, a good, a great one. And if you're a person that does close themselves off spiritually or empathically because it is so difficult to deal with this heavy stuff. I know there's a lot of you that are relating to what Michael's talking about and you didn't even get planted like a tree. You just naturally are spongy like that. It, the more energetic hygiene you can practice, the grounding and discharging and finding solitude in nature is a great way to do it. The more self-confidence you're going to feel, the more able you'll be to detect the vibrations in your field that are coming from other people and not self-identify them. Actually, a great baseline is to just not self-identify at all. <laughs> do that as little as possible. Be, be enter the void, if you will, because technically everything emerges from nothingness and so do you. So there's no harm in that level of detachment. It doesn't make you like a robot. I mean, I guess someone can be detached on a complete, completely detached, but empathy and detachment in the right balance gives you this amazing tool in your own mind and in your own feelings that allows you to navigate your personal craft to places that you choose instead of sort of just being at the mercy of the winds. And then that's important because the more that you can encourage that flame of sovereignty within yourself through being grounded and rooted in the core truth of yourself, which is that this too shall pass. So whatever the thing that you're experiencing, whatever the difficulty, this too shall pass. It's that is the unfettering of all of your chains and weights ultimately. Mm. And so the tree, ironically, being rooted and planted and stuck in one spot is a symbol that we can look to for the attainment of actual freedom. And, and it's no also the, like a perfectly integrated being because it is rooted in place, grounded, and also equal parts shadow, root, and light, limbs. So it is both the light and the dark and fully experiencing, fully integrated in the light and the dark. It is the expanded being. And if you like, I've seen some maps like fractal maps of reality of our universe, of our cosmos and the way that the, the arms of these galaxies are shaped and like these clusters of galaxies and super clusters, they look like tree branches. <laughs> and then there's a dark matter component to it too. And we don't know what that looks like, but what if it looks like roots? <laughs> Yeah, and with without even needing to hypothesize about dark matter, there's just the uh, negative space of the reality. You can look mm -hmm. at that as the dark matter, and if you're not, you know, sure on quantum physics, which I'm not, uh, theoretical physics, I'm definitely not sure on. I love to look at it, but uh, the more I look at it, the more I'm like, I don't know if anybody knows what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> but there is, we do know that there is space sort of negative space that the matter is not in and well it's like i call it negative space because it's like in a drawing there's what you're putting on the paper and then there's the parts of the paper that you didn't put anything on and that that is equally important to giving you the impression of what it is that you're looking at to see what what's there and what's not there so you know it but of course nothing's nothing's completely empty at least in our field around us we know that air has it looks invisible but it's got you know molecules in it that are sustaining so even what we draw energy from and life from it and is a fluid we're in a fluid yeah as, or an ether yeah my like, favorite philosopher david abram he talks about the earth as earth because we walk through 
like an ocean essentially of air of uh, just a different fluid a less dense fluid we're underwater yeah but yeah essentially we're the water and then so this kind of jumps in and also ties back into what you said about Hassan or Hasim and his experience of going up. So a week later from my planting, I came back to Arkansas and was at a, a yoga retreat and I participated in a Kundalini yoga class and had another breakthrough experience um, just on Kundalini breath work on kundalini like while <laughs> while in the throes of a kundalini experience it's some strong shit it is it really is and what had happened was there were these like colorful lights being projected on the underside of trees like on the the bottom of the leaves and i was i went through the kundalini practice got really really activated and then dropped into a posture uh, a yoga posture it's like modified chair pose where i was looking up through my third eye and i could see the canopy of the trees like darkness against these like lit up underside of the leaves. It looked like an ocean and my awareness of gravity flipped and I felt like my spirit body fell out of my body and started to float down to the bottom of an ocean that was up. And as I started to like sink into the darkness, I didn't experience any like terrifying beings or anything but I did feel that there was a gravity to the sun that was pulling me in. Like I got to the point where I could see the sun again at night and it showed me that just like the, the portal in the lava vent at the bottom of the ocean, there was another one at the center of the sun. And for me in my own expression, that was where I came from and I'm on my way down to the lava vent. And so that after I had this experience of being planted and seeing like, the future progression of my soul path of like working my way down to this groundedness, I saw where I came from. So like if I were to look through my body backwards, that faint trail of light or the brighter trail of light was coming from the sun. And so I was able to like float up and see that I didn't enter it this time. I was actually like had this very faint fear of like, if I go back through it, I'm going to be completely expanded like I was and I'm not ready for that right now. And so I just observed it and saw that there was this trail of gold coming through my body and went back and then it connected all the way down to the other thing. So it was like a linear progression through this dimension, like through the earthly dimension of from sun to source and soil. <laughs> why, why is it that going back to the fully expanded state is so frightening? I, cause I have a, I have like a fear of that too. And is it, it's the ego, it's ego death. Does the, you know, does the infant or not infant, the pre-birth baby fear going through the portal of birth, you know, from how I've integrated it is the fear is tapping into a mission, essentially, and it's a disconnect. There's a reason we came here and incarnated here and are here and going through that ego death experience and that fully expanded state, that Cidic Christ like state you are returning or progressing beyond the limits of that we are currently supposed to, if you want to use supposed to. Or, or that should, you chose to. Chose to. That's a great way. We selected to be here for a very specific reason and to do a yet undetermined in our own experience, but there's things that we're here to do. Yeah. And, and if you are to know that, you have to not know and, other things. And the fear, exactly. And the fear I feel is informing us at some intuitive level that we're not supposed to hang out in those expanded states all the time because we're here to do stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, stuff. What, otherwise we would probably just like, exactly. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I love what you're talking about of the reverse gravity. It just gave me this intuitive sort of clicking in my mind of that. Oh, okay. Everything is, we are in a dualistic material world that's important and as, as much as i love non-dual philosophy we walk around on two legs i mean we are here to be in the duality and it's it's important it's an important factor it's not something to be transcended uh, and i think spiritual teachers that try to tell you that they're going to help you transcend duality um be be careful about that don't you know don't necessarily just buy all that because there might be there could be some problems with that philosophically speaking. And like you said, we, we, uh, that fear is there for a reason of going into the all knowing state because we don't want to give away 
the plot <laughs> of what we're yeah. here, our chosen experiences. And so this whole, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense that if there's like a p downward pushing force on our material body, that there's an uplifting force on our energy body. It makes total sense. There's two centers of gravity, but therefore the different, therefore the material and the non-material, mm -hmm. the energetic, yeah. or not even energetic, the, the, the completely subtle, because mm -hmm. even energy is material in a sense. Mm -hmm. And it has an entropy of its own as well, that like heat tries to disperse itself across the entire medium that it can and even itself out. Uh, it's just really it's just really interesting concept i don't really have anywhere to go with it other than it is reflected in really fun occult m maps of the reality and of the fractal like you're talking about in cosmic egg theory or the world tree in many different cultures that have the world tree or the egg there's a column or a spine that has these two forces in um, parallel with each other or sometimes opposing each other and meeting in the middle. And that is what humanity is. I mean, that's what we are. It, we are right in the middle of the axis. The cross is in a sense, metaphorically speaking, it's that column or that spine that we walk around on. And also that the world has that the axis mundi and then the horizontal. So whenever we are not living to our full potential or not expressing our potential spiritually or really stuck in just a materialistic mode, we do just kind of go around in a circle on that horizontal plane. And it's really important to realize that we do have the vertical plane and the vertical axis. And I think that it's a probable that we're here to either ascend, generally speaking, to ascend that axis or to descend on that axis and neither is necessarily the wrong thing, but we get, I think we get this idea of fallen angels from this very notion that there are beings that are those of us that uh, uh, experience earth as a stepping down uh, from a spiritual plane. And then there's those of us that are experiencing earth as a rising up out of a very material existence whether maybe we incarnated as like literally animals at a certain point just to have that full grounded material, you know, not instinctual, almost automatic type of uh, life. I don't know. This is interesting stuff, though. And we've, the theme. we've gone into a lot of weird places in this conversation so far. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And the theme, the overarching theme and like goal, if I were to put it on it, in my experience through my life thus far is always integration. It's not necessarily the path of ascension or descension. It's integrating and not judging. So you are observing that there's this path and going from a high vibration to a low vibration is often marked as a bad thing. But I don't necessarily see it that way because it could be going from a very ungrounded state of not being fully aware, like only joyous and only like happy and singing all the time to being completely oblivious of the pain that is going on just outside of your awareness. Hmm. So integrating is expanding and contracting. It's the fullness of experience. Um, and in the same time, it's not judging. It's, it's experiencing those shifts, those changes while at the same time learning to not judge. And I've had trouble with judging myself for my vibration lowering, so to speak, mm -hmm. at times. And that's uh, an obstruction, I think. And there's water, a waterfall isn't evil because the water is falling, right? This is a good metaphor that just mm -hmm. pops into my head. But if you obstruct the flow of that water and create a barrier to the, you don't want the water to get to the waterfall, you could create stagnation that that becomes toxic so the or real surge at some point <laughs> yeah then you really have a problem a pressure builds up and then there's uh -huh. an explosion so if we're going to define something as evil because there does there is this expression of evil in the world that we see in like you know the narrative of human trafficking of hollywood pedophilia or you know 
I can name many, many things as a heretic that I am. <laughs> I can name lots of examples of evil. But what makes it evil isn't that people are experiencing hardship. It is that there is an obstruction created and a stagnation created and a stasis created where, um, you know, when you enslave another being, that's it for their spiritual development unless they get out of slavery. And when a person, well, and then the real truth that we come to is that we create slavery for ourselves. The master slave dynamic is an internal thing. So uh, getting the, f getting back into the flow, whether you're flowing up, you're flowing uh, upstream somehow on that spiritual updraft, like the way birds do on thermals of warm air pockets that lift them up literally, or whether you're flowing downstream the way water does. The important thing is that you keep flowing. If what you are attracted to, if what you want to move towards is something very material and very sensual, very non-spiritual, but you feel a, a great attraction to it. I mean, I've heard a lot of really good teachers and healers talk about this, that like, you know, I may bring up, oh, I kind of have had video game addiction in my life. And they'll say, well, if what you really want to do is do that, do it and enjoy it to the fullest without obstructing your own experience of it through thinking it's wrong. Now, mm. you know, if what I was attracted to doing was mur murdering people in real life or something, <laughs> then there'd be, there's a distinction to be made there. Of course, you know, you don't, well, that's obstructing others, but I don't think that someone that is, I don't think that a healthy un, un or a healthy being, unless they've had an extreme trauma is ever going to be attracted to doing something really heinous. I think that, Generally speaking, though, what we're attracted to is how we know where the flow is at. Mm. And it's OK to want to flow towards more physical experiences. And as long as that's not creating like these obstructions for other people, enslaving yourself to the experience uh, addictions, you know, mm. that those are all lessons we can, even if we get stuck in those type of quagmires, they're things that are going to be important to our development that, that we had those experiences. Otherwise we wouldn't have been attracted there in the first place. Kind of like, I mean, we're talking about karma now, but it's just important to not judge ourselves for the karma that we're carrying and prevent ourselves from Un unraveling it you know and uh, be aware of the karma you're creating or resolving yeah and of course you'll never be aware of the karma you're creating to the fullest degree mm -hmm. unless you are completely vertical mm -hmm. and those experiences are usually temporary and for a reason mm -hmm. because you can't give away can't give it all away <laughs> but this, this is so cool <laughs> yeah. so everything in that last chunk that we talked about of the expansion experience and the dissension experience and integration and awareness ties back into where we started this conversation of laughter yoga and so this is the big download that i've gotten in the expansion that i've seen or the integration rather that i've seen in laughter yoga is laughter is a breath that is both an inhale and an exhale it is an integrated breath it is a high vibration and a low vibration it has the same is informed by sadness just as much as it informed by is informed by joy it is the in my experience a full integrated experience in itself and it produces this very clear very aware state after you go through a state of laughter that's why it feels good is it clears out your central column activates your vagus nerve opens up your diaphragm in an energetic sense, it opens your central dantian, which is your like generational connection to the universe. Yeah, it's literally generating energy. Yeah. The way that two poles of a battery hold a charge or cre can create and generate electricity. It, I've never thought about it that way, but it's completely true. And you integrate and you go through that experience of laughing to the point of just like, temporary madness and then you come back in you slow your breath down you bring it really low frequency draw that breath out and you get up and you go back to your life having expanded your extremes for that moment that's why laughter is so important in human development is it pushes our breath like quite literally the essence of our being to the extremes and then allows you to come back to a new state and you're fresh and you're clear and 
I have now integrated that as the sacredness of silliness. <laughs> <laughs> and that's me. And you haven't been nearly silly enough in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm getting ready to go into laughter yoga. So I think from like a, to, to guess, I am getting really deep in the seriousness because I'm about to get really deep in the silliness. Well, I was just being silly. I wasn't <laughs> serious about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for carrying the silliness. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Yeah, we are about to go check out Laughter Yoga. Well, he's going to lead it, but I'm going to finally check it out. And so I think this is a good point to move towards our wrap up. I want you to you know, close any threads on the conversation that you had open that you wanted to touch on and remind people how they can connect with you. And yeah, thanks. For, also, thanks for being here. This has been phenomenal. As always, we went to even deeper places than last time somehow, even though it felt like we already had the deepest conversation ever first time around. So very good. <laughs> Glad we get to have these kind of hangouts and extended chats. It's great. Oh, thank you. Um, the tie up threads. Integration is important. 15 minutes of laughter every day will change your life. Non judgmentally laughing is all you have to do. Um, and I would like to close out with a laugh for all of those who've never experienced it. So there are two kind of pre the pretenses before going into this one is be aware of your container um non-judgment can be informed by your own self but if you're in like earbuds in in a public place don't bust out laughing because it can be jarring for other people because they're not aware of the non-judgment and also make eye contact so if you have other people with you invite them to join in with a little laughter session look in the mirror if you're having trouble dropping into the laughter thankfully oh, that I, works great yeah thankfully i'm here with chance so I, we're gonna get a little warm up i just want to say the first time i ever smoked cannabis for like 30 minutes i stared at myself in a mirror and laughed hysterically and that was like the that was the peak of it and it was i was definitely never the same after that so <laughs> you can definitely laugh at yourself in the mirror it's great i recommend it it's very very tasty so i would like to go into the laugh and this is going to be the expression laugh this was already mentioned that laughter is your own expression and this is really simple you can laugh for no reason and you can also laugh in your most true self so making eye contact look at somebody look at yourself or just drop in and let your most true you laugh come through. <laughs> <laughs> it is automatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't forget eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to like, I tried to stop looking at you. <laughs> oh, and I always end out laughter exercises with very good, very good. Yay. Very good, very good. Yay. Yeah. Very good, very good. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great hanging out. It's been just truly beautiful being able to talk and be on Interverse again for my second round and getting to share laughter yoga and my planting experience. If you're interested in the Humanitry, look up the Humanitry Movement. We have a Facebook group that is public. It's Humanitry Movement, the one. I have a personal Facebook page. Smurphy does stuff. S-M-U-R-P-H-Y does stuff. Um, you can find me on Instagram, on Facebook. It'll be on the show notes. Um, yeah, I am a massage therapist, energy worker, laughter yoga leader, and now defining myself as a humanitarian. And one. a pretty sick dancer. <laughs> I love to dance, too. And a wizard. And a, yeah, Giggle Wizard and Facilitation Fairy are also two other titles that I've adopted this year. One more question real quick. Are there any online resources for laughter yoga? Yeah, so the I was trained through the laughter laughter university or laughter yoga university it's not the same as clown college no it's different um <laughs> the, there's plenty of clown colleges out there but laughter yoga university.org um this is the school designed by madan kataria there are several other similar laughter yoga therapies or laughter therapies and other types of laughter yoga i was trained through the one um by madan kataria the creator of laughter yoga um and yeah, there's lots of different ways to approach it. There's lots of different modalities and therapies that are involved. Uh, but Laughter Yoga University is the one I would look at. They have a list of places you can find laughter yoga cl um, collectives, la laughter yoga groups and meetups. And in January, I will be going and getting trained so I can actually certify laughter yoga leaders. And I will be, after January, I'll be traveling around Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Oklahoma, and getting as many people certified as are seeking um, to share this laughter medicine. I truly do hold that this is my 
this is my mission right now in my life is to teach more people that non-judgmental laughter can and will change your life. Awesome. I can't wait to experience it because weirdly enough, there is still that there is still some kind of resistance internally for me to like do my authentic laugh there at the end. I try, but it's also like, how do you try to do something that should be happening naturally and automatically? So really excited to go do this with the group and share in the group vibe and shatter some shells internally. And uh, I'll report back in the outro here. So. All right, Michael, thanks for being here. That's always a pleasure and an honor. And I love you, brother. This is awesome. I love you too. Thank you. All right, friends, we made it to the end of another episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Had a great time with Michael Murphy. Hanging out in person with somebody I'm friends with from podcasting together is always a big treat for me because (laughs) honestly, I spend enough time almost like secluding myself or cloistering myself away from friends due to working on the show since I have to do it in my free time and it isn't like what pays my bills currently. I I miss out on a lot of fun face-to-face interactions that maybe I otherwise would be having. I don't want to say miss out. I choose, you know, that I'm more interested in pursuing something I'm passionate about. So anyway, long way of saying uh, it's a huge, huge pleasure to actually get to be live in the studio with Michael and follow up this conversation with a laughter yoga session. Hard to describe other than I laughed a lot. <laughs> I mean, I could go through and talk about some of the specific exercises. I guess I'll tell you a little bit structurally of how it went down. It was broken into moments of some kind of laughter, lots of different varieties of laughter, followed by little mindfulness check-ins like mini group meditations where there's a lot of body sensing going on. At least that's how I was doing it. And uh, the laughter got very intense at points. I actually felt like I had done a huge like abs workout the next day and the day after I was really feeling it. Oh, and the weirdest thing that happened during it that I wanted to share was at the very end, we were, we were asked to try to let out the last bit of laughter that might have kind of built up in the system. Because when you're doing as much laughter as there is during a laughter yoga session, it's like a charge, energetic charge builds up in your body. So I was looking for it. I kept having these little giggles and spurts that would come out. And I thought that that's the end of it. That's the end of it. But then finally, during this final meditation, mindfulness check-in part of the session, I felt this almost like warm, tingling energy in my core, kind of in my chest and in my torso. And as I laughed, this last huge laugh that (laughs) came from making eye contact with someone in the circle, I felt the energy come out of my core and fly out my right arm. It was like lightning, but it was invisible. And my arm went all pins and needles after that. It was very strange. I mean, I wasn't doing anything super strenuous activity wise that would make me go pins and needles. Something definitely happened. There was like real movement happening internally from the laughter yoga session and felt great after it. And I really appreciate Michael for sharing that. He also shared some extremely high quality cacao with me, which was great and heart opening. And I got some from him and now that might kind of become my new podcast ritual before shows is drink some cacao. (laughs) I like it. It's a good alternative to coffee because sometimes at the beginning of an episode, if I just chug some coffee to get like amped for it, I can be a little jittery, (laughs) but I had a great time all, all around with Michael and hope you guys go follow him on social media, Smurfy, the squizzard on Instagram or something like that. I'll link it in the show notes for sure. And I'm glad that I decided to make the plus extension free to everybody this time. I didn't want to cut Michael's really interesting story about the humanity experience, you know, in half, like I would probably have had to, to make the plus extension exclusive like I normally would. And it seemed right. We're at the end of the year. It's been a great success for me this year, as far as expanding the show, getting interesting people on, keeping up a decent pace and rhythm and schedule of producing episodes, which can be a little demanding at times, but I also make sure that if I'm feeling close to the edge of burnout that I just don't <laughs> I just don't do stuff for a while and that helps too. 
but it is tricky. I mean, we talk a lot of this year about getting into a natural rhythm of your creative flow and your life cycles and getting that to match the biological rhythms you're in and nature's rhythms. And when it comes to making a weekly show, you almost can't do that if your production schedule is such that you're like working on it from week to week. I would think that maybe an answer to that is to do batch processing where maybe I get a bunch of interviews done in one week and then I kind of space out the working on the editing of that stuff over the course of the, the rest of the month. I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. And you guys probably don't need to hear me talk shop about podcast production, but it is a lot of work and I'm happy to say that it hasn't burnt me out. I'm actually more excited about Interverse than I ever have been. And I hope you guys are too. We've got great places to go next year. I've already got some interesting guests lined up to start off the year. I may or may not re release another full length episode before the end of 2019. We'll see. I probably will. I've got a great one already recorded. The Return of Zane Daniel, comic book author of Righteous. I'm sure you guys remember that dude because he left a big impression on me personally. And if you do want more Interverse content, there is a three hour live streamed conversation that I had with Jamie Seed and a bunch of other past guests on the show who came and called in during our three hour live stream, including Michael Murphy, who told a very interesting story about uh, getting kind of in trouble with the law, but not actually doing anything illegal and how some mystical mounds were involved. And I've been really interested in the North American mound situation, these fascinating structures all over the continent. So for me, that was pretty fascinating to hear about how he sort of had a astral experience at these mounds. And there was a lot more in the three hour live stream than that. And it was a lot of fun to do. And as I get more accustomed to the live thing, I'll probably do more of that in the future. So follow Interverse on Facebook and YouTube. If you want to catch the videos as they're happening, you can comment, call in, whatever. I'll do more of those in the future, but no set schedule on it for now. So just stay tuned. And yeah, thanks to all the patrons who's made this year the best year yet. As far as Patreon goes, we keep growing lose a couple people here and there but overall we're getting bigger as far as our tribe and you can connect with more of the tribe also on facebook at the interverse podcast group i've got a whatsapp channel as well that is just exclusive to podcast uh, listeners and a couple of the guests are in that group hit me up if you want access to that we can put our minds together and answer some questions for each other or just share funny or fun things or whatever you guys want to do i want to make more connections with the Interverse community going forward is something I'm not particularly like good at as far as social media using it two ways goes. Like I tend to just put stuff out there and not go looking for people to talk to. But I do want to connect with you guys. The listeners are what make the show actually possible, of course. If I was just doing this for myself, well, it would still be worth it because these conversations I have are fantastic. But it wouldn't have the same importance to me if I wasn't also sharing it with you guys. So thank you for listening. Thanks for making this such a great year. 2020 is going to be definitely weird and pro hopefully more good ways than <laughs> uh, difficult ways, but I'm excited. We've got a lot ahead of us and yeah, I guess that's it. Happy whatever holiday you like and, you know, watch out for all that sugar that's going to be around your family gatherings. <laughs> Hope you get some cool presents if people are giving you presents. And most of all, give yourself the best present of all, which is taking care of yourself, loving yourself, not being too hard on yourself and keeping up that amazing journey of transformation into the person who does the things that you always wanted to do and that you came here to do because you're already that person and you can do any of the things. But that's it for me. I might catch you guys one more time, like I said, before the end of the year. But if I don't, have a great new year. And we will talk soon. And I love you guys. Unconditionally. Even the weirdest of you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Talk to you guys soon.